steel, sweat, hardiness, and experience. The Maya Vaft in Papenburg is building a cruise ship powered entirely by natural gas, the Aida Nova. How is such a huge, complex ship created? Up to now, this is a one-of-a-kind project. Though state-of-the-art technology is used, hard physical labor and workmanship are just as important. The shipbuilders put the gigantic ship together from individual modules. These enormous propellers will eventually be powered by liquid gas. The biggest challenge is the race against time. From the start of construction to delivery, the shipyard has just 20 months and 25 days. High tech and manual work. The construction of a cruise liner. Maya Vaft is in its seventh generation of family ownership. For 200 years, fishing trawlers, light vessels, and cruise ships have all been built here. 3,500 people work here, supplemented by thousands of suppliers and service providers. At the press of a button, a plasma cutter with a flame of 30,000 degrees cuts the first steel plate. This signals the official beginning of the new cruise liner's construction. For workers, engineers, planners, architects, and the shipping company, the adventure begins. They have 633 days until the scheduled delivery date. Here are the criteria. The finished product is to be the most modern, most environmentally friendly ship ever to sail the world's oceans. The cost, nearly 1 billion euros. The ship was entirely computer designed, so it's already possible to take a virtual stroll along the luxurious decks and through the restaurants. On the designer's holodeck. Thanks to virtual reality, the bridge wing, the side of the ship's control bridge, is already accessible, visually at least. Virtual reality allows the planners to move around the as-yet unbuilt ship and see exactly where there's still space to place a pipe or to run a cable. Actually, we're planning, though the technology doesn't yet really even exist while we're planning it. Or it's technology that's not yet developed to the point where it could be used at this time. The process begins with a new ship concept, with truly new technology. Then development groups are formed, which will bring these visions into reality. This is a high-tech ship. But the actual shell requires good old-fashioned physical labor. Ships are still built in the same way as steam engines were in the past, or the Eiffel Tower. One steel plate after the other is welded together. The largest plates are joined together in the welding center by a giant robot, an absolute necessity as the dimensions are enormous. The new ship will be 337 meters long and 42 meters wide, longer than three soccer fields. These plans are becoming ever more detailed. We have at first a section, a block, and then a floating unit. And from two of the floating units, we'll have a ship. Only by using this section-by-section -section construction technique can Mayavaft assemble such a large ship within 18 months. Shipbuilders first weld individual steel plates together into sections. They then put eight sections together to form a block. Out of 90 such blocks, the new ship eventually emerges. The advantage is that the builders can work on different parts of the ship at the same time. The men work according to a precise plan. Pipes, which will later run along the ceiling, are already being installed in the relevant segments. So that the fitters don't have to work above their heads, everything's done on the floor. A huge rocker arm then turns the parts over again. Change of location. Neptune Vaft in Rostock also belongs to Maya Vaft. Here at the same time, the rear floating section is being built. The four engines and the three gas tanks will also be installed here in Rostock. The two larger tanks are 35 meters long and eight meters in height. Later liquefied natural gas or LNG will be stored inside them. LNG is natural gas that's cooled down to minus 162 degrees, turning it into its liquid form. The contents of these three fuel tanks are sufficient for a cruise of at least two weeks.
The four engines that will power the ship are being built right next door. In this manufacturing facility for large engines, there are pistons as big as beer kegs, with piston rings as thick as fingers and crankshafts as long as a truck. The crankshaft is pre-assembled by us. The counterweights are bolted to the crankshaft as well as the connecting rods. This entire pre-assembly is inserted into the engine block, secured and bolted to the foundation. The new ship's engines are called dual fuel engines. They can be operated with both liquefied natural gas and marine diesel. Using LPG almost completely eliminates the emission of fine particles and sulfur oxides. And it also significantly reduces emissions of nitrogen oxides and CO2. An engine is assembled in only about five weeks by just two specialists. But what is the actual procedure for assembling an engine? Matthias Hattel and his colleague Eric Busch start with the cylinder crankcase, which lies upside down. Into this, they insert the crankshaft, the so-called crank drive. Then they turn everything around so that the engine is the right way up and they can fit the other components from the top. First, they insert the liners, then the pistons with the connecting rods. The two men then connect the whole thing to the crankshaft, which completes the lower part. On top, they then attach the cylinder heads and the exhaust system. Finally, Hattel and Bush check the dimensions of the finished product. This is the fine tuning, so to speak. Eric measures the piston flanges. He turns the crankshaft with an electric power unit. It needs to be accurate within one hundredth of a millimeter for an engine of 2,000 tons. So, we're doing flange breathing at cylinder station one. It's checked once to see how the crankshaft gaps open, and this will also be recorded for the experts. And this is done again at the test stand to observe how the axle bends or warps. This is important because otherwise the crankshaft would break under too much strain. It could be too tight, or there's a defect in the part, or it doesn't sit properly. We can detect this through testing. Once assembled, the engine arrives at the test bench. Now it has to show what it can do, how well it can perform, and also whether it keeps to the emission limits and runs as cleanly as it should. The main difference is that we don't produce soot, and thereby the engine runs very cleanly. Even in the smokestack, there's no smoke. The test bench. Soundproof and with all the required fire protection equipment, this is where all new engines run for the first time. The engine starts at precisely 500 revolutions in three minutes. Exhaust gases are discharged upwards and measured. Cooling water pipes, fuel lines and lubrication pipes had to be installed beforehand. After passing all the tests, the run-in phase begins. The engine will now run for about 10 hours. The parts have to be retracted from the crankshaft and the control shaft, especially the bearings, but also the bushings and pistons. After a final inspection, acceptance and certification, the engines are placed into the paint box. Here they are given the color the customer has chosen. These LNG engines are being painted white. Now the units are ready to be installed. June 30th, 503 days to hand over. The four engines are being delivered. Each engine weighs more than 200 tons. It's only a short way across to the Neptune Baft. Here they're installed into the engine module. Everything that has to go inside has already been mounted by the workers and prepared. The technicians now screw the motors tightly onto the bearing blocks. Eight weeks later, the first floating unit is ready. Soon the noise at the Rostock Neptune Waft will be deafening as metal scrapes against metal. Now things get slippery, greasy and oily. First the men build a slide for the floating unit. It has to be stable and all welds must be smooth. 
Using hydraulic pressure, the first floating unit is pushed out of the shipyard hangar. On a film of oil, the 120-meter long, 42-meter wide, and three-deck-high hull section slides out of the hangar, centimeter by centimeter. Finally, the hull section comes to rest on a pontoon. Slowly, it's gradually lowered, and then the engine room module floats on its own. September 28th, 433 days to go. After further work and preparations, the engine room module leaves the Neptune shipyard for Papenburg. The weather's fine. The tugboats pull the module with a short line and then head for the Kiel Fjord. This transport is no easy task. The huge floating unit has to be towed all the way from Rostock to Papenburg in East Friesland. In the numerous locks along the Kiel Canal, it's really a tight fit. Naturally, everything's been well prepared, calculated and rehearsed. In the end, the transport goes exactly according to plan. Here at the Mayavaft, they've been waiting for the module, and it's brought into the hangar right away. Back to the Neptune yard in Rostock. Here, men are installing the LPG tanks in the second floating unit. In the meantime, they've been given their insulation. The hall's ready, the crane's ready, the final obstacles are moved to one side. The tank storage chamber with the round bearing casings has also been prepared. So let's get it hooked up. The gigantic tank with its insulation and aluminum hull looks almost like some object of modern design. Maybe also reminiscent of an airship or a submarine. Now the 35-meter Colossus just needs to be put in the right place. Daniel Leopold guides the joystick with a steady hand. Even if this looks routine, it's not every day he installs such a gigantic tank. There's not much leeway at the sides. Routine? Maybe a little. But never underestimate the danger. One has a lot of responsibility. Now just a few inches off the ground, the notch on the tanks must sit exactly on the round bearing housings. Two specialists squeeze underneath the tank and take measurements repeatedly. They're glued together. Underneath they have wood, so they're lying on wood. On one side there's another sheet underneath, so the tank can move if it has to. Only when the last tank is properly in place can the team in Rostock breathe easily. Now they'll get the second floating unit finished, so it too can soon be on its way to Papenburg. 430 kilometers away at the Meyerwerft. It's not been an idle time by any means. As soon as the first floating unit arrived in the hangar, the shipbuilders started assembling the blocks. The 500-meter-long production hall is the largest covered dry dock in the world. Here, welding, hammering, and abrasive grinding. 400 days to go to handover. In the block ceiling panels, pipes are already being installed everywhere. They'll later be connected together. A total of 250 kilometers of pipes and shafts run through the ship. Since 2010, Maya Vaft has been manufacturing its own pipes. In the pipe hall, there are pipes in all shapes and sizes. Ventilation pipes, water pipes, sewage pipes, gas pipes, heating pipes. Such a cruise liner has some 52,000 individual pipes. Specialists are working here with welding robots and two bending machines. Thus, seams can be welded with great precision and pipes bent to the exact degree. But sometimes good old-fashioned workmanship is also required. That's when the experts are needed, as in this case. A special design was requested that a machine can't deliver. This is a job for Jürgen Pahl. He's the man for custom-made pipes of all kinds, and he's been doing it for 25 years. And only he knows just how he does it. One thing is clear, in the end, a pipe is produced and it's a perfect fit. These are actual fixed points, thus there isn't really much to adjust. It has to be an exact fit. 
building up the blocks onto the hull section with the engine module continues apace. Then the dock is flooded. The Colossus floats up. December 11th. The weather's not very pleasant here in the north, just under zero degrees and a stiff wind. And it started snowing. The big gate is opened and a cold draft blows through. Outside, two tugboats get to work. They have to pull the hull section out of the hangar. The second section will be arriving from Rostock before midnight. Centimeter by centimeter, the tugboats pull the hull section out of the hall. The wind is strong, blowing directly onto the broad side of the hull, pushing it sideways towards the pier. The tugboat goes full throttle to make some headway against the wind. Almost there. In the end, the shipbuilders, using winches and muscle power, pull the hull section to the pier. An uncomfortable job in December, but these men are tough. They put up the gangway right away, and work inside the hull continues directly. After dark, the ship's hull section is securely moored outside Poppenborg's Maya Vaft. Meanwhile, outside, a ghost ship is approaching. The hangar is empty. Everything's ready. The gates are wide open. The module with the LNG tanks has arrived from Rostock and is being inched into the hall. The tugboat at the front corrects the course to the left or right. Everything's been calculated, but still a close watch is kept. There's very little space at the sides. Slowly, it's eased into place. Now the front tugboat has to be taken outside again. No problem for the crane. It just lifts it up in the air and carries it behind the module. From outside, another tugboat brings in the road module, which is anchored into position. Then the gate can be closed again. After that, the water is pumped out of the dock. Work continues immediately, in parallel on the hull section outside and on the new arrival in the hangar. Now things are getting serious. Everything's on the move. 299 days to handover. The men ride up in transport baskets on the outside of the hull, arriving more quickly to their workplaces. Otherwise, they'd have to climb 40 meters up the stairs several times a day. Everyone here knows exactly what to do. Of course, we have a construction plan, how the ship is to be built. There's also a schedule, and everything is coordinated through the planning department. We have a site manager who then coordinates everything together with AIDA. Of course, they're constantly checking what we're doing. Inside or outside, top or bottom. Everywhere cables are being laid, paneling fitted, and new materials brought in. Inside, the areas for the passengers are continually being worked on. And then the prefabricated cabins. They're manufactured by a subcontractor during the day, brought here in the afternoon and installed in the evening. The decks have already been prepared for the cabins. Some windows have already been installed. The insulation is in place, the floor has been sound and heat-proofed. In only a few months, all this will look like this. But until then, there's still a long way to go. This is the elevator now, but this is what the passengers will see in the future. The clock's ticking, 292 days to handover. Since 2007, Maya Vaft has been manufacturing passenger cabins itself, using state-of-the-art assembly line production. First step, the door, the door lock, and the cabin walls. There are 22 steps, so 22 workstations. It works very much like an automobile assembly line. The conveyor belt runs at 3.5 millimeters per second. And after only 20 minutes, a finished cabin leaves the hall, complete with TV and reading lamp. Sandra Vintatour and her team check whether everything is exactly as it should be. The furniture parts, whether they've been correctly put together, the dimensions, whether the socket strips have been sensibly positioned, whether there are any gaps, mistakes, scratches and all that. This is the side where the balcony area will be, and that's the gangway side. The finished cabins, which are ready to be installed, are delivered by truck into the hall right next to the ship's side. 
This is a standard cabin, and it will be installed on the ship right away. We're on a pace of 30 minutes per cabin, meaning from the start on the podium here, we've 30 minutes to get the cabin in position and be all set for the next one. So, a 30-minute time frame. 30 minutes. The men really have no time to lose. The cabin's lifted by crane, aligned, and then pushed into the correct position using muscle power. The cabins are aligned using the old-fashioned plumb line. We use a plumb line to align them, not a laser, because someone might bump into that and then the whole thing is askew. When everything fits, the workers weld the cabin frame firmly into place. You can nicely see inside. Everything's already there, from the chair, the trash can, the mattress, the bed. It's all there. It makes the job easier, especially later when finishing the cabin. Building such a gigantic ship is extremely complex. There are literally millions of individual items, 2,500 kilometers of cable and 65,000 square meters of carpet alone. Everything has to fit perfectly and arrive at the right time at the right place. How can anyone control the process and maintain an overview? It really starts with the deliveries. All parts have to be controlled and inspected to see if they're the correct parts. Are they okay? Before they're installed by the subcontractors. Then the inspection process starts, first by the internal yard, then by the yard and the owner, in this case, AIDA. And finally, the classification inspector certification. Then, when everything works, everything's good. It would be nice if we could simply walk through walls and visually inspect every pipe and cable duct. But we can, in the virtual reality room. Even during the planning phase, experts can visualize the various rooms. The implementation of the construction work is digitally transferred to a 3D model and can be viewed in the VR facility. The plans drawn up by the engineers during the day are converted overnight and fed into the system. When the production worker arrives the next day, he has the latest data at his disposal. This way, potential errors can be avoided or corrected early on in the planning phase or, at the latest, during construction. Planners can turn the entire ship around, open up the floor and check the positioning of the tanks. They can even go right inside the tanks. The same data we see here now can later be shared with all employees. 291 days to handover. An alarm signal. The strongest crane for the shipbuilders, the Imperial Eagle, can carry up to 800 metric tons on its four hooks. And hanging from this crane is an important element, the ship's future theatrium. So far, it's just the shell, a huge steel structure. It will become a 360-degree theater with 11 LED walls, laser show, and a retractable elevating stage for performers. Logistics are really important. For example, in the theatrium here, the equipment for the rising platform and the LED video wall is already installed. If you wanted to do that later, you'd have to bring them on board bit by bit. And here it's pre-installed in the unit. But now the enormous steel structure is still hanging from the crane. It first has to be taken from the block building site, positioned to the millimeter on the hull section, and fixed precisely into place. Now all cranes have to go back. Only then can we come here with the block. Then all the cranes go over again because the block's just too high. Then we drive back here with it, and finally we can position the block over the ship. It's like the game Tetris for Giants. Of course, safety takes top priority. No one's allowed to stand underneath the hanging theatrium. Slowly and carefully, the crane operator maneuvers the gigantic structure above the ship into the correct position. Then it's time to go, and the workers don their safety equipment. They approach the edge carefully. Next, they weld on the towing hooks.
With a number of hydraulic presses, they bring the theatrium to precisely the right position, and then check again. Elsewhere in the yard, they're working on the roofing of the future beach club. Later, this will be the main public area with several pools and bars. It's a complicated construction and will later be covered with a transparent foil and has to withstand all storms and ship's movements, even in heavy seas. The water slide for the swimming pool is ready for installation. A lot of specialist companies and subcontractors work on such a gigantic ship, contributing their share to the big picture. All this work has to be perfectly coordinated. Anyone who's ever built a house knows how difficult it can be. So what must it be like building a cruise liner? It's now mid-February, 270 more days to hand over. The shipyard's preparing for an important step. The doors of the dock will soon be closed because a wedding is fast approaching. After all the blocks on the second hull section have been welded into place, the aft section is the first to leave the hangar. To enable this, the shipbuilders flood the dock again. Then the middle section, which has been outside up to now, comes back into the hall. It's followed by the aft section, and both are aligned. Before workers can weld the 19 decks and the up to 42 meter wide modules together, they must first bring both into correct position to the millimeter. Men are working on all decks at the same time, welding, measuring, and making all the preparations for finally joining the two halves of the giant ship together. They've been positioned here in the dry dock, which will be flooded again. Then we move the two halves closer together, and then they're brought into their final position. In the middle of the 500-meter-long hangar is the bridge of the new cruise liner. This will eventually be the control center of the Aida Nova. So far, it just looks like some kind of huge steel cake full of holes. On the inside, construction work has already begun. In the control room alone, 30 kilometers of electric cables are to be laid. What we see here now are the supply cables for this section. Electricity, light, internet, that sort of thing. But the most important cables for the ship's controls are installed later. This is because the control cables can only be laid and connected to machines after the bridge has been placed onto the ship. The dock is now flooded. The two sections of the ship now float into position. Then, by means of spot welds, they are roughly tacked together. The exact alignment of the huge hulls, each weighing 20,000 tons, is then undertaken using a sophisticated system of ballast tanks. They're on port and on starboard. Water's pumped in and out so we can keep it balanced. It's very plain to see that the ship still has a slit down the middle. The shipbuilders now have 1,000 meters of welding ahead of them. First, a ceramic guide rail is laid into the slit. Then they can begin with the actual welding. The men gradually work their way down from deck 17. But there are still some steel plates that first have to be aligned. Now we put the starboard press on it. Then we pull them properly together, so they're nice and tight. A hydraulic ram has a pulling power of up to 50 tons, and at one point, four or five are sometimes used at the same time. The two parts are pulled together, and workers then do the welding. In the 125-meter-wide hall, more structural parts are ready and waiting. Besides the bridge, there's also the four-element section with the climbing garden. Here, passengers will be able to climb to lofty heights over treetops. This is what it will eventually look like. All this still needs to be installed on the ship. But something very important is still missing, the complete foredeck with the bow and bow thrusters. Block 69 is still missing too, 
It lies between the bow and the middle section and weighs 500 tons. It's lowered down and then aligned. The block will be installed in just one shift. The individual blocks are on a sliding system. They're raised, placed on hydraulic sliding carriages, and pushed into the right position. The bow of the Aida Nova is designed to cut almost vertically through the water. There's only one small bulbous bow. Later, this will barely be visible as it lies below the waterline. The entire front section is pushed into position. Here too, it's first tacked on to secure the bow. The weld resembles a freshly stitched wound. Meanwhile, the finishing work continues inside. The floor is laid. There's an insulating layer on the steel plates, and on top of that, a thin steel sheet. It's a kind of sprung floor. In the restaurant's kitchen areas, self-leveling screed is being laid. Whether shell construction work or interior fittings, general manager Sven Fahle has to keep track of it all. Today, he's meeting the ship's architects in an equipment hall. The interior designers, together with the shipyard, decide on shapes, colors, dimensions, and materials. The various contractors then have to implement the plans. If questions or difficulties arise during installation work, the team will meet up, just like today. The construction materials used for ships are generally of a higher quality than for hotels. Siegfried Schindler is one of the most highly sought-after ship architects. Hotel. Doing interior design for a hotel is easy compared to what we're doing here. Here we're working with a completely different range of materials, but in very limited spatial dimensions. A ship's really about using every millimeter. It's not Sven Fahler's only appointment today. Next, he goes deep down into the ship's belly. This week, the first engine was tested. It had already been run on the test bench, but only here can you really see how the engine interacts with the other components. Here in the main engine room, there's still scaffolding. Above the main machine, the ceiling is still being painted. The last work's getting done. It'll all come down in two weeks. Then we'll have full access to our main engines and the individual cylinders. Crane operator Reinhold Willems on his way to his shift. Today, he'll be installing the bridge. He's the man with the uncanny instinct. Willems is the only one at the shipyard with his own elevator, which takes him up here to his workplace, 60 meters above the floor. He quickly explains the cockpit. Here on the right side are the levers for the hoists. The left one is for land side, in the middle is the main lift, the right lever is for the sea side. We differentiate between sea and land side. With his crane, which he can control to the centimeter, Willems brings the 345-ton component into its exact position. Then the welders take over and join the 50-meter-wide bridge to the ship. A few days later, a distinguished visitor appears on the bridge. Captain Boris Becker inspects his future workplace. The wing with the ship controls. From here, He'll have the best view when docking in the harbor. There's plenty of space on the bridge, 500 square meters to be exact. Here's the carpet. The underlayer has already been installed, and that's a big step. I remember four weeks ago when the floor here was still open. The bridge will be guarded around the clock, but it does still need a little furniture. There'll be two chairs here. On one side, normally the captain. On the other side, there's a place for a pilot when needed. In front, two officers, the navigator and the co-navigator, who can steer the ship themselves. May 4th, 196 days to handover. Another important milestone in the construction of this giant cruise liner is now imminent. The installation of the two azipods. The azipod is a 360-degree rotating gondola with a propeller attached to it. This is what propels and steers the ship. It used to be you only had a propeller. 
a rudder, and a bow thruster, which you'd use to move the stern. Now you have azipods. You can really get the force of the water at the exact angle you want. Of course, a big advancement. Now you can steer the ship much more precisely. Still attached to the azipod is a test propeller. This propeller doesn't have blades yet. This is a zero-drive propeller. With it, we can test practically everything right in the shipyard without moving the ship. By crane, the 230 metric ton, 12 meter long azipod is set down beneath the stern. The port side azipod is already mounted. With a so-called low floor wagon, they bring the second motor to its position on the starboard side, where its location at the stern has already been prepared. There is not very much room to maneuver. The challenge is to mount these 230 metric tons, which we see in the background, to the exact millimeter. So we don't have much room to play with. We have to drive under it, and we have about half a millimeter of tolerance in the guide pins. It will take hours until everything is so precisely aligned that the guide pins fit perfectly and the retaining bolts can be tightened. After that, the electronics will be connected. May 30th, 170 days to handover. For the first time, the entire Aida Nova has water under its keel. Now it's a real ship. The vessel floats 140 meters to a new position. Here it is given the Aida fleet's typical puckered lips logo. Its 250 square meters of surface area will require 622 liters of paint. In total, 250 tons of paint and corrosion protection are applied. The 622 liters for the artwork on the bow is really just a drop in the ocean, but of course it's important for the passengers. The workers are now in the process of assembling the propellers. Seven men fasten the five flukes onto the right-hand azipod. Their contact surfaces must be meticulously clean, so they'll run as optimally as possible. Each sheet weighs three tons, and each propeller has a diameter of six meters. In the same night, everything is completed. The ship's propulsion is ready. August 11th, only 97 days to hand over. Everyone is highly focused. The ship is still in the hangar with about a thousand different things still to be done. Here, workers are painting the 360 meter anchor chain. Over a length of 27 meters, the chain is always unbroken. Only then is there a link that can be opened, the so-called canter shackle. This is really the only thing every 27 meters that connects the chain together. Only at these points can you actually separate the chain. Fitters are installing the outside balconies. Certified controllers are underway all around the ship, checking, measuring, recording. This area has passed its final inspection, so on to the next one. There's a lot going on in the kitchens too. Dumb waiters are being installed. The theatrium gets its final cables and connections. For me, the challenge is definitely collaborating with other contractors because it all has to fit together. So much needs to be coordinated. In numerous corridors, craftsmen are laying tiles. Among all the construction jobs, there's a good deal of skilled workmanship required. This carpenter's been spending weeks making a continuous handrail for stairway railings. He's completed 400 meters and has another 1.3 kilometers to go. August 18th, 90 days until handover. The home straight is in sight. Changes in the corridors to the cabins are clearly visible, but a lot of trimming still has to be fitted. Briefings for the first crews arriving at the shipyard. This advanced group will be cleaning the first of 2,626 cabins. On the bridge, the electronic connections to the engine room and the azipods are tested. The beach club is also progressing. 1,600 square meters of special ultraviolet permeable foil is being applied across the roof, a job for the industrial climbers. August 21st, 2018, only 87 days to handover. 
The ship finally comes out into the open. It takes two hours for the ocean-going giant to be pulled out of the 500-meter hangar completely. Then it's moored at the so-called outfitting berth. Here, the preparations are made for the naming ceremony. Ten days later, everything's ready. The brand new ocean liner is officially named. Early October, 38 days until scheduled delivery, the ship is glistening in the sunshine. From the outside, it looks almost finished, but inside, there's still a lot of high pressure work to do. In addition, everything else a floating hotel needs to actually set sail is being loaded. Food arrives on board. Crockery needs to be unpacked and distributed. Office chairs are being assembled. Everyone does their bit to help. Fire zones five and seven is where the chairs will be placed. Check how many desks are ready, how many offices are accessible. Meanwhile, on the bridge, the radar is being checked, and one of the pools is being tested with water. Thousands of plates are being put away, and this is the most efficient method. Cooking trials in the kitchen to test out the technology and to make sure the crew on board doesn't go hungry. The corridors to the cabins, at least, are finally finished, and the theatrium has been totally transformed. Lifeboats have been lifted on board by crane. Below deck, specialists connect up all the cables for the onboard TV studio. We have 200 lamps that still need to be installed. This is a TV studio, so good lighting is extremely important. This is what it looks like now, and this is what it will look like in a few weeks. A studio for an audience of 400. Live shows will be produced and broadcast from here. It's the world's very first television studio on board a cruise liner. Meanwhile, the technical acceptance procedures on board continue unabated. The pressure is growing, just over a month to handover. On October 9th, the ship leaves Papenburg, heading for Eemshaven in the Netherlands. The rest of the crew embarks here. The interior fitting work is now almost completed. The restaurants are in operation, and the engine room too has been completed, inspected, and given the okay. This is one of the four LNG units, 15,440 kilowatt each at 514 revs. Senior engineer Gerhard Hoffmann, along with the LNG engineer, checks all the settings once again. The gas tanks are located behind the wall. With so much combustible gas on the ship, appropriate precautions are necessary. The safety standards for these tanks is incredibly high. For instance, we have gas detectors and special ventilation systems. And you can see here the tanks themselves are complex but highly robust. Additionally, they're surrounded by a controlled nitrogen atmosphere, and that's all behind here. December 12th, Bremerhaven. The handover is 21 days later than planned. Complexity and new technology have taken their toll. Nevertheless, it's a ceremonious occasion. The flags are exchanged. The shipyard's German flag is taken down, and the Italian flag of the cruise ship company is hoisted. This is a very special moment for Captain Boris Becker. For the very first time, he'll set sail with his new ship this evening. Destination, Lisbon. Four days later in the port of Lisbon, the crossing from Bremerhaven via Rotterdam to Portugal went well without any problems. Next stop, Tenerife. The final preparations. New crew members are familiarizing themselves with the ship. In the panorama suite, the beds are made and drinks are in the fridge. The terrace is ready for the first sunbathers. 20 different cabin categories leave nothing to be desired. For the first time, there are also cabins for singles. 17 restaurants now await the guests' arrival. There's also the climbing garden, the outside water slide, the spa area with its saunas and numerous indoor and outdoor bars. The theatrium is ready for its big premiere. Backstage, actors and singers are preparing for the show. Everyone's very nervous. Up until now, they've only rehearsed on land. On this new onboard stage, everything feels totally different. Yeah. 
Yes, I'm very excited. Actually, we were working so much and we couldn't wait to perform this in the actual costumes, like for, for an actual audience. So we are really excited because we prepared a lot for this. Let's rock that ship. A living room concert with a virtual band. That means the band is playing digitally on the LED screen. But the singers are performing live in the foreground. The entire show is written especially for this new technology. The choreography is the work of Cirque du Soleil's Benjamin Pring and Alexei Yuvarov. My imagination has even been surpassed. When we first stood in this room, scaffolding everywhere, steel, work lights, you could already guess what it's going to become. And, of course, this re-inspires the imagination to finally create such an on-stage magic. These men can also create magic. For the travel agencies, the press and the internet, there are as yet still no pictures of the new ship out at sea. This is a job for the Skynamic team. These Berliners are stars of the drone scene. Their job today is to capture the Aida Nova at full speed. You have to go relatively far away to get the ship into the picture at all, and of course, then it's difficult to still see the drone. You always have to keep the drone at a certain angle to yourself and at the same time control it. All over the ship, the final screws are tightened, whether in the elevator or outside. Everywhere, things are being polished, checked and cleaned to make sure they look their best, and gradually, even the tiniest faults are wiped off the list. Below deck, the dry cleaning service has gone into operation. Clean clothes can be issued to each individual crew member automatically because a chip has been sewn into every piece of clothing. You select it, determine the amount, you order it. And the system also knows you've picked it up, and you can wear it until you bring it back. The cooks work on menu selections. The pizza baker is familiarizing himself with his pizza kitchen. The cleaning machines for the kitchen floors have been charged up, and the crew restaurant is also ready. The crew comes from more than 50 countries, and so the kitchen has a range of food options for every taste. Everyone can eat whatever they'd like, and that's a beautiful thing. I'm also a fan of Indian food, tandoori and such things, you know, that the colleagues often have here on display, but Asian is good as well. Or there's also mint steak with mushroom sauce. To be sure that the 17 restaurants on board have enough to eat for the international crew of 1,500 and the more than 5,000 guests, food supplies will be taken on board again at Tenerife. The ship has 24 refrigerated and unrefrigerated storage houses with a total of 4,000 square meters. The ship reaches Tenerife. Captain and crew are finally at their destination, yet at the same time, they're back at the beginning because now Aida Nova's journey across the oceans really begins. From the first cut, it's taken 660 days for the ship to be built. Engineering skill, perfect organization, the shipyard's craftsmanship, and the cruise company have all contributed to making this possible. The very first guests arrive on board tomorrow. And then it will be time to set sail for the first ever cruise liner to be powered completely by liquid gas.